This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Often when we hear a story, when we talk about a story, we often think about what our response is to God. So we take as a given that God is doing something in the world. There's something happening that God has done. And then it's our task to respond to that work in some way. And so a lot of sermons are about this response, about how we should act, what we should do, how we should be, things like that. But not so many are about what God is doing. We sort of refer generally to what God is doing. And there are some weekends that are better at it than others. So there's Easter Sunday where it's like, well, God died and rose again. And that's really extraordinary because through Christ, we all die and rise again. And that's sort of a very clear picture of what God is doing. But then there are some, some weekends where it's not quite as clear. Well, this is one of those weekends where the stories are all about what God is doing, all about what God is about for you and for me. And it starts early on. We start getting the picture in this story from Exodus, where God's work is sort of the main event of what's happening. Obviously, there are Israelites uh, who are a big part of the story, but the main piece is how God works and responds to them. And of course, in this story, you may remember the Israelites have just left Egypt. Well, they're not Israelites yet. yet. I'm sorry, they're Hebrews. And they've just left Egypt. And of course, they were enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. Each of these different slaves had a different role. Some of them were making the bricks for the temples and all of the other municipal buildings. Some of them were house slaves and servants. Some of them uh, had great tasks. Some of them were in charge of many, many other slaves and servants and had to make sure that everything was running smoothly. But of course, through that story uh, that you may know, uh, Moses went to Egypt and his brother Aaron proclaimed that the people should go and thus the Israelite people, no, no, the Hebrew people, sorry, I'm so used to saying Israelite. The Hebrew people, the reason I say this is because they didn't start getting called Israelites until after Abraham and Abraham. uh, Oh, wait, no, it is Israelites. (laughs) This is going off the rails quick. Let me get back to... (laughs) Let me get back to what I was saying. The Israelites and Hebrews and all of the people that were in that group that were leaving Egypt had a lot to get through. 
They were running away after the Pharaoh changed his mind, after all of the Egyptian army was chasing after them. But then God opened up the sea for them to travel through it. God uh, opened up the waters, created dry ground so that the people could move through that dry ground into freedom. And of course, the Egyptians were blocked from following them, and then they find themselves in the wilderness. And this is where our story picks up today, where the Israelites and the Hebrews and all of their friends are in the wilderness looking and trying to figure out what's next. And that's a hard thing because most of those people had it pretty good, all things considered, in Egypt. They knew where they were going to sleep every night. They knew where their meal was going to come from. And aside from the slavery and the servitude, all of those basic needs were met. At the very beginning, they responded well to the work that God was doing in their lives, but at this point in the story, their complaining overtook them. They started looking around, they started seeing that it was real work to find food in the wilderness, that it was real work to set up tents every single day and wander around. Forty years they took on this nomadic endeavor through the wilderness, and they started getting impatient. So they complain up to God, and they say, it would have been better if we just stayed in Egypt. At least then we knew what was happening next. At least then we knew what was in store for us. God hears those complaints. God hears those cries out in the wilderness, and God responds. Not to each person bringing them back to the level that they knew. God wasn't building palaces for the ones who used to work in the palace. God wasn't uh, giving only a little bit of food to the ones who are used to only a little bit of food. But instead, God cares for that people as a whole. And that's descriptive of how God cares for God's people. Certainly, God knows each of us individually. God cares for us each individually. But God also recognizes and cares for us as a whole. And so when God responds to these needs, he doesn't give three quails to one person and one quail to another person and sort of a scraggly wing to another person. God sends quails to the whole people of Israel to feed them in the evening. Then God sends manna, uh, that stuff that looks like frost. The reason it's called manna is because manna is the Hebrew word for what is it, as the uh, Hebrews said in the story today. God sends this what is it stuff for them to eat in the morning, and it sustains them. You don't get more uh, manna uh, if you were used to having more. You don't get less if you were used to having less. Instead, God sends the manna to care for all of the people. God sees all of the people as in it together. God cares for all of the people together. That brings us to the story from the New Testament today, where once again, we have a story about somebody caring for all of the people, regardless of what their situation is, regardless of where they came from which is quite shocking for most of us, and it was shocking for the people who were looking for work in the story. Now, clearly, this story about the landowner isn't about the fields. If the landowner was really concerned about the fields, I think that there would be a lot more prior planning, wouldn't you? He would know how many vines there were that needed to be taken care of. He would know exactly how many workers could do exactly how much work in exactly the right amount of time. He would go to that village square, he would gather the exact number that he needed, and he probably wouldn't return because he had planned it all out. You know, Somerset uh, Winery knows uh, to invite everybody on one day so that they can all stomp the grapes because they know exactly how many grapes need stomping. And there's a little bit of cleanup work afterward, but they start at one time in the morning, and that's when it happens. Well, for this landowner, for this vineyard owner, it seems like the vineyard, it seems like the vines, it seems like the grapes isn't what he's especially interested in because he keeps on going back to the village square to find people. All throughout the story, we have no idea how the harvest is going. We have no idea how many grapes there are. We have no idea if everybody was happy and healthy. We have no idea what was going on at the vineyard, but we do know that that owner went back throughout the day over and over and over and over again to start gathering people. And in that story, it's the people that matter to the land not the grapes. He returns over and over again to seek out people who need work, who need a job, who need support, who need care. And that's the landowner's work. He doesn't 
look at the end of the day to figure out who was there longer, who was there shorter. Rather, the landowner's goal is to meet the needs of these people, all of those people, not each individual one. And it's scandalous to the ones who got there early in the morning. They feel like they deserve a little bit more. But that's not what the landowner is trying to solve. That's not the problem that the landowner is trying to respond to. The landowner is trying to make sure that everybody is well cared for for that day. Make sure everybody there has work. Make sure everybody there has food. Everybody can find a place to stay in the evening. I imagine the landowner does it all again the same day. I don't know how many grapes this vineyard has, but judging from the story, it sounds like this is something that's an ongoing exercise, constantly looking for people and bringing them back. It's a story about God. It's a story about what God does for each of us. And when God looks out across this room, when God looks across this city, across this nation, across this world, God sees, of course, each of us, but God also sees all of us. All of us together. And God works for the good of all of us, of that whole, as much as God can. We talk about the coming kingdom when all is made right, when creation is renewed and restored, when finally there will be that equality where everybody is well cared for and nobody wants. And we can do what we can to get there now, but we aren't there yet. But this story inspires us because it tells us what God is up to and how God values people like you and me. As equally blessed, as equally worthy of love, as equally worthy of support. That's what that first is last and last is first business is all about. It doesn't matter where you are in the line, you're in the line, and the blessing has come to you whether you like it or not. Especially this weekend when we think about people who have different abilities and different situations in life, we highlight more than ever the fact that God cares for each of us and that God cares for all of us. There are some people who feel defined by their situation in life or their role in life, by their abilities or by their disabilities, by the fact of whether or not they can walk, whether or not they can get out of bed, whether or not they can read or write as well as others, whether or not they can understand something as well as others. And unfortunately, in our society, some people tend to value human beings based on those accountings. But if you read this story, and if you think about what God is doing you see a big difference between the way some of us act and the way that God acts. Because when God sees all of God's people spread out through the world, God doesn't try to account some of us better than others. God sees the whole, God loves the whole, and God works for the flourishing and the joy of the whole. Not one above another or one less than another, but all of us. And God sees all of us and sees us all as definitely abled, as the word is this weekend, definitely able to bear God's love, definitely able to bear God's grace, definitely able to bear God's hope. It's for all. It's for each of us. It's for all of us. That's what grace is. When we talk about grace, when we throw that word around in here, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Grace that meets each and every one of us. Grace that works for the flourishing of each and every one of us. Grace that works to bring all of us as we live together up higher and higher and higher to realize the well-being of each other, to support the well-being of each other, to make sure that each of us feel love and feel support and feel encouragement. That's what grace is. It's something that falls on all of us, bears us all up, strengthens us all, and sends us all out. It's not divvied up based on some arbitrary accounting measure. It's given to us all, whether we show up at first thing in the morning, or nine, or three, or five, or whenever it is. It's a grace that returns to pick us up from the village square all throughout the day. Whether or not we knew to get there first thing in the morning, or if we only heard about it at the end of the day. Grace doesn't care. Grace isn't worried about that. Grace is only concerned that we're cared for, that we're loved. God looks at all of us and sees a whole bunch of workers who may be bumping into each other and not sure where the uh, work is to be done, not sure of our own value, not sure of where we're expected to be. 
But then God shows up. God invites us in. God shows us that there are possibilities for us, and God reminds us each and every day that this is yet another day where we can receive that grace and hope. I imagine that this vineyard is big. I imagine that there's a lot of work to be done. And I imagine that in each and every day, all throughout the day, there is an opportunity to hang around in the village square and get picked up by God and driven into the kingdom. Some days, we may not get to the pickup point right on time. But that's okay because God comes back and God picks us up. And whether or not we're there first thing in the morning has no bearing on whether or not we're deserving of grace. Because through what God is doing, through God's eyes, we are. Amen.